All righty, I am pleased to be joined by guest Brad Fowler of the Pint Glass Football Podcast to talk about the NFL, Super Bowl, and stuff like that. How's it going, Brad? Hey, doing good. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, again, thanks for coming on on a last-second notice. Um, and again, don't forget to check out his podcast. It'll be down the links uh, in the description down below. And let's talk. Let's before we start talking about the Super Bowl and about the NFL and everything that happened this week. Um, if you want to talk about your podcast, how we can get it, um, what's it about, all that stuff. Yeah, I appreciate it. So we do a weekly show. It's uh, myself and my co-host, Tyrone Powell, and we talk everything NFL and college football, news, breakdowns, all the in-depth stuff. We preview games, make predictions, talk betting lines, just about anything you can imagine as far as college football and NFL. And we do a seasonal show that runs through April. We start with the NFL draft in April and we end with the Super Bowl. So we actually just wrapped up season three with our Super Bowl preview episode. And so we take a little hiatus after the Super Bowl here and come back with a bunch of NFL draft stuff and, and get ready for the, uh, the, you know, throughout the summer and kind of cover the teams. And, you know, we get a lot of guests, uh, football media professionals and, and people like yourself to come on and, and talk about these teams and get you ready for the next season. But but, yeah, just wrapped up, obviously, with the Super Bowl. But I'm excited to talk some football with you today here and the, all the news and everything that's flying around. If you guys want to check out my show, it's on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, all the major players, Pint Glass Football Podcast. Really appreciate it. All right, don't forget to check that out. Again, the links will be down in the description below. Uh, before we talk, start talking about the Super Bowl, let's start with the and uh, the news that happened this week. Of course, the first or some big ones was the New Orleans Saints. Of course, Sean Payton is no longer there. He stepped down a few weeks ago, and they're going to hire Dennis Allen, their D coordinator. Um, I'm not really surprised by that move. I kind of saw that coming, but what did you think about the Saints hiring Allen as their next head coach? Yeah, it kind of felt a little ho-hum, right? We kind of expected it. I think a lot of people that follow football closely knew that this was probably going to be the move they were going to make. The Sean Payton retirement, I'm putting that in air quotes here, I think kind of caught the Saints off guard a little bit as far as an organization. And when things get shaken up, you look for stability. And that's what this really feels like to me. He has a lot of experience, not only as a coordinator there, he's been with New Orleans for a long time. He knows this organization well, obviously, but he's he was also a head coach for the Raiders. So he, he has experience being the top guy and he's really respected around the league. He's known as a great X's and O's guy, a guy that can really scheme, especially the defensive side of the ball, as we know. The question really becomes for me is the Saints are really in a, deep uh, hole here with the cap situation. They're going to be in a lot of trouble. We could see a lot of turnover next season for this roster. I think there's question marks at quarterback. You know, we're going to have to see what he handles here because it's kind of a new era here, post Breeze, post Sean Payton, and he's kind of going to have to grab the wheel here and kind of get this franchise back on solid ground. They've been a very good franchise, a very solid franchise these last several years. I think it's a very solid hire we're just going to have to see if it's a great hire and only time will tell. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, like I said, kind of already saw this coming. Dennis Allen, who I think was the head coach during the time when Sean Payton was out with COVID. So I wasn't surprised by the hiring. And yeah, you said the cap is going to be a huge problem with $74 million over the cap. And of course, they still have to wonder what they're going to do with quarterback. Is Jameis Winston the guy? What are they going to do with Taysom Hill? I think Taysom Hill was more of a Sean Payton guy. So what does Dennis Allen think of him? Um, so I was I was a little, I wasn't really surprised by the hiring, but as you mentioned, it's going to be intriguing to see what the Saints do. I feel like their division is pretty wide open though, because Brady just retired. I don't think the Buccaneers are going to be that great next year. Um, do you think the Saints can still win that division? Because you also have Atlanta and Carolina, and they're not very good either. So what do you think about the Saints' odds of actually winning the NFC South next year? It wouldn't surprise me. I, I think they've got to be in the mix, like you said. The Buccaneers have a huge hole now at the quarterback position. Kyle Trask, a guy they drafted out of Florida recently, he's probably not ready to be a starter in this league or a very low-end starter, I'd imagine. He's, he was more of a developmental guy coming out of the draft, so that's a huge question mark there. They still have a really talented roster in Tampa, so I wouldn't I, – I expect them to be competitive, but you're right. The division feels really wide open. We know Matt Ryan is getting on the back nine of his career, so they're not the team they used to be. They're still 
you know, going to be a team that could compete in this division, but there's nobody that really scares you. Carolina kind of feels like a train wreck right now. They've got a good young defense, but they too have big question marks at the quarterback position. And I'm not really sold on Matt Rule as a head coach either. So it feels like this is a division that anybody can win. It's kind of been that way for a long time down there in the NFC South, but it wouldn't surprise me if with all the talent this team has, especially on the defensive side of the ball, they've got some good playmakers on offense. I wouldn't be surprised if they were in the mix and possibly fighting to get into the wild card uh, conversation. Yeah, the thing about with the NFC South is, again, Brady just retired, and I'm not sure Kyle Trask is the answer. And we know Blaine Gabbard is definitely not the answer. But you look at a team, too, they're probably going to lose Chris Godwin. I don't think they're going to keep Gronk because I think the only reason why he was playing was because of Brady. He had some rumors that he wants to play with Joe Burrow, but I doubt he plays next year. And the defense, I think a lot of those guys are free agents. So, again, I don't know if Tampa is going to be what they were. I think I could see them actually being competitive, but – I think New Orleans has a still a decent chance of winning the playoffs. And yeah, Atlanta's getting older, and I'm not sure what they're going to be like next year. Carolina is kind of trash right now, and they have, they have to figure out what they're going to do with the quarterback position. Are they going to keep Christian McCaffrey? His contract is so big right now, and he has he's only played, what, seven games the last few years or the last two years? So I really I could see the Saints still somehow winning that division or somewhere being in contention as well. So um I mean, what do you think or what do you think the Saints will be next year? What do you, do you have a projection of what or a prediction of what record they'll finish next year? If I was just going to throw it out there, they're probably a 7-win team. Maybe they get to 8 wins. I don't see them doing much more than that because of the limitations at the quarterback position and like we talked about, there, there's going to be some turnover on this roster as well. I think organizationally there's, there's still enough pieces there for them to be competitive in what's going to be a pretty weak division but I still don't think it's enough for them to really make some noise. I'd be surprised if they get over 500. Yeah, and the thing about, too, about the Saints as well is one of their best offensive players now, Alvin Kamar, he's now in trouble because he was uh, convicted of a battery charge recently, and he could possibly be facing jail time. So that doesn't help the Saints at all. And do you think the Saints should keep Jameis Winston or try to bring him back? Yeah, I would. I, I would try to bring him back. I think he did some nice things there before the injury. Um, I think he's a guy that we kind of know what he is at this point. He's a talented guy. He's a little bit turnover prone, but it looked like he was actually starting to fit into that system pretty well. And I think he is a guy that, in like we said, in a division with so many question marks at quarterback, he would kind of jump to the front of the list of maybe the best quarterback in this division. So I think from that standpoint and the fact that the draft really doesn't look very promising for young quarterbacks coming out, uh, I think it'd be a smart move to bring him in and, and kind of keep that continuity there on the offensive side of the ball. And he wasn't bad either. I mean, they were still, as you mentioned, they were still in contention. And I don't think Taysom Hill is a quarterback. I don't know what he's going to what, – what's going to happen with Hill because I doubt anybody will want to trade for that contract. But, I mean, we'll see what happens. Do you have any thoughts about Taysom Hill? You know, the thing about Taysom Hill is he's that Swiss Army knife guy. He's a gadget guy, a gadget quarterback. I never saw him as a legit starter in this league. There was conversations about could he be the future. I I, I don't think he's the future. I think we saw that now. He's a guy that you can bring in in certain situations. He does a lot of really neat things on the football field. He's a fun football player to watch. I mean, he can do a lot of different things for your offense and give you some wrinkles on offense, but he's not a quarterback that should be starting in the National Football League. He's a guy that should come in on certain packages, give the defense some looks. But, yeah, I don't think he's a guy that you can build around, and I think Jameis makes a lot more sense as far as the starter goes. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree with you. And I think a lot of people at one time compared Taysom Hill to Lamar Jackson. I was like, no, that's not true at all. Taysom Hill is – is he's, at times, as you mentioned, he can play quarterback, but he can't be an every-down quarterback. And in this league, you definitely need a – like, a, really, you need a top-ten quarterback if you want to win a Super Bowl. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens with the Saints. Um, it's going to be an interesting offseason, especially with all the news recently of Kamar and all the other guys. So, um, another team that hired a new coach was the Texans. They went out and hired Lovey Smith. I was a little surprised because I thought they were going to hire Jerome. Gerard Mayo, um, but they go ahead and decide to hire Lovey Smith. Um, the Texans don't really have a lot of talent. They're one of the worst teams in the league. Um, did you like the hiring of Lovey Smith? No, no, I was not. I was not a fan of this hire at all. And bef- before I put on the gloves and beat up this hire, let's let's look at what there is to like about the hire. He does bring a lot of experience. I think he's an above average defensive mind, a guy who has a lot of experience on that side of the ball. And he's also going to call the defensive plays for them. 
And once again, like we've talked about with Dennis Allen, it kind of offers a little bit of continuity. But that's about it. That's about all I like about this hire because when you look at what I don't like about this hire, the Texans fired David Coley. And this is a guy who I actually thought did a really good job considering the awful roster that he took over. I thought it was really unfair for them to move off of him so quickly. They really didn't give him any type of chance at all. Now you bring in Smith, who's going on 64 years old. He's been fired from his last three head coaching jobs, two that were in the NFL, one the Big Ten. And he was the defensive coordinator this year for the Texans for one of the worst defenses in the NFL. Now, I know the roster's not good. It's maybe the worst roster in the NFL, but he really didn't show you anything that makes you think that this guy's ready for another shot at a head coach. He hasn't had a winning season as an NFL head coach since 2012. The Texans just continue to be one of the worst run franchises in pro sports. If I'm a Texans fan, I'm really not excited about the direction that they went with this hire. I was a little surprised too, because I thought they were going to hire, as I mentioned earlier, I thought they were going to hire Gerard Mayo. And I thought they were going to hire another Patriots assistant because the GM for the Texans was in new England for a while. Um, I don't think Lovey Smith's a bad coach. I mean, the last time the bears have not, I don't think the bears have won a playoff game since Lovey Smith was the head coach. And I think he kind of got screwed in Chicago, but yeah, as you mentioned, he wasn't great in Tampa. He wasn't great at Illinois. Um, he was the defensive corner last year, and they weren't good last year at all. And I, I, I agree with you as well. I think they shouldn't have fired David Cauley. Um, I think he kind of knew he wasn't going to last long. But, I mean, with the tech, the Texans didn't have much to work with. I mean, they had four wins. Um, they're still – I don't know what they're going to do with Deshaun Watson. There's not. There's a good chance that he might not play again. Um, but, yeah, I don't mind the hire. But, again, as you mentioned, there's some problems with this Texans organization that just doesn't make any sense. And um, – what do you think about the Deshaun Watson situation? Do you actually think he'll play this year or? Well, your guess is as good as mine. It's really hard to say with all the uh, potential litigation that could be going on. I don't even want to speculate. I would, I would think at some point he's going to be back in the NFL. It, to me, it kind of feels like one of those situations that's going to have to be settled outside of the courtroom. Um, from everything I had heard last, he was kind of digging his feet in and didn't want to go that route. I'm not sure. I mean, at, at a certain point, you have to look up at the hourglass and the sand's running through it. He's a young guy, but how many of your prime years do you want to throw away here? So I think as far as the off-field stuff, th they've got to get it sorted out. And I think if that means uh, settling, you know, that's probably his best route and it probably gets him into the NFL sooner than later. But it's just hard to say what he's going to do, what his lawyers are advising him to do. You know, it's just a lot of unknowns. And I'm sure there's a ton of stuff behind the scenes that most of us don't know anything about. Yeah, it, it's really interesting, too. And I think I, I think what was it? Uh, Nick Casario or Nick Casiriani or I can't quite remember his last name, but the Texans GM, he was talking about if they do decide to. Well, he actually said that there's just probably <clears throat> excuse me there's probably a better chance that he doesn't play for the Texans ever again. And I think he said he wanted at least six draft picks and then players, which I think is too much, especially with what's happening right now. But, you know, I hope he ends up playing somehow. But, yet yeah, there's – I wouldn't be surprised if he missed this year as well. And there's been reports that there's there's not even close to getting the uh, – the you know, they're not even close to getting done. So I would love to see Watson come back, but I'm not sure we're ever going to – not for a while at least. Um, do you think the Texans will – stick with Davis Mills for one more year because he didn't have a terrible year. I think he had 16 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, but do you think the Texans will stick with Mills for one more year? I hope they do. I really do because I think he quietly had a really nice rookie season considering the chaos of that franchise around him. He really had some nice moments and showed a lot of things. He was a guy, we, like I said earlier, we do a lot of NFL draft uh, coverage on our podcast. And he was a guy that was starting to kind of heat up as far as climbing the draft boards going into the draft. A kind of an unknown guy for a lot of people. Played at Stanford and, you know, on the West Coast, a team that hadn't been very good the last couple of years. Don't get a lot of big national TV games. So a lot of people didn't see him play. Plus, he sat out, I believe, the 2020 season. So... This was a guy that a lot of people didn't know a whole lot about, but he came in and really showed some nice things um, in his workouts and started kind of getting some momentum. And then he took it to the field and showed me a lot. I actually think this is a guy that has the prototypical skill set that you're looking for in an NFL starter and is a developmental guy. But I like what I saw from him. I really hope that he gets a chance because I think he does have some upside as far as developing 
Yeah, and especially with what happened, uh, or if, especially if you look at the draft this year, it's not exactly a quarterback. Um, there's not a lot of great quarterbacks in this draft. And I know next year there's going to be loaded with talent of Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud come out. They're definitely going to be the top names. But this year you don't really look. There's not really a quarterback that jumps off the page. I think you were mentioning that earlier. But, yeah, Davis Mills had a solid year. Um, he was actually the Texans, I think, first draft selection last year. I think he was taken in the third round. So I think Mills is ha has some – at least what I saw from last year, he definitely has some upside. But you know, we'll t time will tell to see if he's actually the quarterback. Um, but again, I with the way with the Texans are, it's there's there's most likely they're probably going to get a next quarterback next year. But I, I agree with you. I think they need to stick with Mills for at least one more year. Um, let's move on to another team that recently hired a coach. I think they were the last team to hire a coach, but the Dolphins hired Mike McDaniel's. I think it was the Niners' offensive coordinator. I was a little surprised by this hire. Um, were you surprised by this hire as well? Yeah, this one caught me off guard. This was a name that I don't think was on a lot of people's radars. You know, Mike McDaniel, he was technically the offensive coordinator in San Francisco, but head coach Kyle Shanahan called the plays. Now he'll become the now he's gonna become a first time head coach who's also gonna call the offense apparently at Miami. That's a huge, huge red flag for me. It's hard enough becoming a first time head coach but also becoming a first-time play caller on top of that, I think he's putting a lot on his plate. There's a lack of experience with this hire that's a bit alarming. Only one year as a coordinator, and like I said, didn't even call the plays, now jumping to this head coaching position. I, I think Miami, uh, it, it just kind of feels like an, an out there, you know, like the, almost just kind of reaching for this guy, um, hoping to – you know, find a diamond in the rough with this hire. And when you look at it, Miami was the only head coaching interview that he had. Not a single other NFL team that had any openings even request even requested an interview for Mike McDaniel. So that's a bit alarming if I'm a Dolphins fan. I actually did not know that. So yeah, that would be alarming if I was a Dolphins fan. Um, and the whole right now, the Dolphins, I think they're going to stick with Tuba for one more year. But do you think Mike McDaniel will be, or Mike McDaniel's will actually be able to make Tua Tungavaloa a franchise quarterback? No, I don't, because I just don't think he is. I think we've seen what Tua is at this point. Um, I think he's a low end starter, um, and that's really kind of his ceiling. He's not a terrible quarterback, but he's certainly not the guy that people thought he would be, being the fifth overall pick. I, I, the offensive line has some holes. The running game could use some help. I think he's going to need a lot of things around him to go well to elevate his game. I think he's just one of those quarterbacks. He's not a guy that's going to carry this franchise, and I think we've seen that. And when you draft a guy that early, that's kind of what you're hoping is, is for a franchise quarterback that can elevate the team around him, make the guys around him better. I just don't see that from Tua. I really don't. I think he's a very limited quarterback. I think he, he shows some nice accuracy. He has some nice plays, but – I, I just don't see a very high ceiling on a guy like Tua, and I'm not sure any coach could really get him, you know, to another uh, level, so to speak. Maybe, maybe he gets a little better in, in a run game system that I expect McDaniel to run a lot more play action, a lot more running game to complement the pass. But with that being said, I, I still think his ceiling is pretty low. Yeah, I mean, he was – he was at times, I mean, the Dolphins started one and seven last year and they ended up finishing the year, uh, I think nine and eight or something like that. And there were some upsides, but yeah, there's a lot of limitations to, to his game and he doesn't have the best offense in the world, but I mean, he did have Jalen Waddle who had a pretty solid year and I'm not sure exactly. The Dolphins are more of a defensive team. At least they were one of their best defensive teams last year. But I really don't know, as you mentioned earlier, I don't know if two is the guy. And again, Mike Dan, it's going to be hard for a first-time coach to actually be able to, you know, develop two into a franchise guy like the way he were the where the way he was drafted. Because again, he was drafted before Justin Herbert. So that's another thing as well. Um, do you think the Dolphins can finally make the playoffs, or do you think they'll take a step back next year? I, I expect a step back. I think getting rid of a guy like Brian Flores was a huge mistake. This is a guy who I think was widely respected around the league as being a very good coach and had this team really, I think, moving in the right direction. And it's just really unfortunate what's what's happened there. But bringing in a new coach, like we talked about, a guy who has very limited experience and is going to try to be the 
the head coach and the offensive coordinator. I, I, it's just a big red flag. I think it's a mess. I think the Dolphins continue to shoot themselves in the foot. And mention uh, talking about the bar, you just mentioned Brian Flores. Um, I have we ever, I mean, the whole thing right now with his allegations, uh, what do you think about it? And, um, I mean, do you think he'll be a head coach next year, maybe? No, I don't think he will. I think, I think that he has upset a lot of really important people in the NFL and it wouldn't surprise me at all if we never see him in the NFL again, which is really unfortunate. It, it's, it's really terrible because this is like, I just said a minute ago, this is a guy who I think is a very good coach and I think was becoming possibly a great coach and just didn't get his chance to continue there. And if all these allegations are true, it's a really, really bad look for the NFL. It's a really big black eye. I know Roger Goodell had his uh, state of the address um, uh, speech or, or uh, interview. I don't know what you call it, but basically where he addresses the media about the state of the league today. And it was interesting because the overwhelming majority of the questions were about this topic, racial injustice, discrimination. How are they going to fix it? And it's just... When you've got the Super Bowl and it's your prime time biggest event, everybody should be talking about Burrow and the Rams and all this. And in all anybody can talk about is this negative publicity. It's a really bad look. I'm sure it put a really sour taste in Roger Goodell's mouth. And and, and rightfully so, because if, if this is true, it's it's ugly and it's really unfortunate. Yeah, it, I agree there. And I think, too, there was rumors that Houston was looking into hire him. But, of course, with all this happening, they kind of avoided it. But I think he would have probably been a better hire than Levy Smith. But, you know, you know, time will tell. Um, let's start talking about the Super Bowl now. And, of course, it's the Rams and Bengals. Not a lot of people saw the Bengals. Some people saw the Rams. But um, what did you think about the championship games from, I guess it would be now two weeks ago? Well, you know, on, on my podcast, we were talking about, is was this the greatest playoffs ever? I, I think it's certainly in a conversation. This was awesome. Now, the wild card round was a little bit of a dud, but from the divisional round on, it's been pretty amazing. We have had so many good games, overtime games, walk-off winners, competitive games. It's been so exciting. If the Super Bowl even lives up to half of these playoff games, we're in for a good one. And when you look at the AFC Championship, Man, what a crazy game this was. You've got the Chiefs, the team that everyone kind of expected to be there, the Bengals that are this hot upstart team, the underdog, and they just continue to surprise everybody. The Chiefs were heavy Super Bowl favorites going into that game. They were seven-point favorites over the Bengals before kickoff. Then they get out to that 21-3 lead and a 21-10 lead with five seconds left in this in the first half. And they go for that play. To, instead of uh, opting for the field goal, they go for it. Obviously, they, they make the throw to Tyreek Hill behind the line of scrimmage. He gets tackled, and the Bengals grabbed all the momentum. It's like the game completely flipped after that play, and it really had me questioning. And it's something we've talked about on my show is the analytics debate. And how we, we've seen this whole shift to going for it on fourth down instead of kicking field goals. And and look, I don't want to be the old school get off my lawn guy. I mean, I think there's a place in the game for analytics. I think, you know, there is a place for it. And it, there's times to go for it. I think there's times where it, it makes sense. But if you kick the field goal there, you're up 14 points. And that's kind of a key number, as we know, because that's two touchdowns. And now you've got all the momentum. And you've got all the momentum going into the second half. But instead, they make a huge stop, and you could just feel that game turn at that moment. And they had that huge comeback. It was really exciting. But, yeah, um, I, I want your thoughts. I, what did you make of it? Because it felt like Mahomes, as great as this guy is, I mean, let's, let's face it, he could hang, hang it up today, and he'd probably get a gold jacket. He's that great. And he still has a long career ahead of him, as it looks like. But he has these streaks where he just kind of – loses it. it it's almost like it just he can be a little bit of a hot and cold player that second half going eight for 18 55 yards two picks he really kind of fell apart in the second half and overtime of this game 
Yeah, he was not great. I'll agree with that. In the first half, he was playing great. Again, they were up 21-3 at one time. And, of course, I, I thought at the time when they were up 21-10 with, like, five seconds left to go, I'm like, just kick the field goal. You'll be up by 14 points. They decided to go for it. That, of course, that, I think, was the game, as you mentioned, all the momentum went to Cincinnati. But, yeah, Joe Burrow, uh, not Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes seems to be that guy where he'll be really hot, and then when he's really hot, he's really hot, and then when he's really cold, he's really cold, and he'll have those stretches. But, yeah, he was not good in the second half, and I think that was a huge reason why the Chiefs didn't win was because Mahomes, who I think still is the best quarterback in the league, did not perform well at all in that second half. And he normally doesn't throw that many interceptions. But yeah, if you throw two interceptions against a very good Bengals team, you're most likely going to lose. And again, I agree with you there, I think. But I think that he, like I said, the game with like, what, five seconds left to go in the first half, they should have kicked the field goal. I think that was the game right there. And I mean, it just goes to show you that, you know, as you mentioned, analytics play a huge part of the game, but at times you just have to make the smart decision. And, you know, I think at times analytics deserves to be in the game, but, you know, I think at times too, you know, you need to, you know, make the smart, you know, make the smart play. But again, I, I agree with you with mostly what you were saying, you know, Patrick Mahomes can be that guy where he can be really hot and then he can be really cold. But at the end of the day, I think he still has the best quarterback, and the Chiefs most likely will be in the AFC Championship game next year. And is there any other thing you want to add to that? No, I agree with you. And, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm, you know, trying to take a shot at Mahomes. I mean, like I said, this this guy is amazing. You know, there's 32 teams in the league that would all line up for him in a heartbeat for their quarterback. He's, he's an awesome quarterback, an awesome player. And you're right. They're going to be a contender as long as he's under center period it doesn't matter you know Tyreek Kill, Kelsey all these guys yeah that's great and those guys are great Andy Reid's great I don't want to take away anything from his team but this kid is really really special but he does have those moments we saw it earlier in the season too those first couple of weeks where the the Chiefs came out of the gates a little slow a little sluggish on offense and there was even a couple games where the, in the middle of the season where they started winning games but they had all these like close wins low scoring wins where it was almost the defense that was kind of bailing them out at times this season and it was really interesting because the defense played really good in that AFC Championship game. They really contained Burrow and Chase for the most part. They had a great game plan. And it was shocking to see the defense play that well and the Chiefs still not be able to pull it out. And it was really because the offense just couldn't get out of its own way in the second half. Well, yeah, you mentioned, too, where the G the defense early in the year was not very good. And then it came at the end of the year. It started actually becoming that team that we saw from a year ago. But, yeah, I think when uh, Mahomes is, I think, third year when they won the Super Bowl, you kind of, the Chiefs kind of had a slow start then, too. And at times, the defense kind of bailed them out a little bit. And I think there was the game this year, too, where they played against the Giants. And they didn't play that great at all. But the defense was able to win the game then. And I think they won 20 to 17. But. Yeah, at times, you know, Mahomes, as, as as you mentioned, he is the best quarterback in the league, and he's very talented. And again, he'll probably be a Hall of Famer if he didn't play another down. But at times, you know, you do see kind of the defense bailing him out at times. But, you know, we'll see what happens next year. I mean, he's still got a Super Bowl ring. He's still an MVP. He's still the best quarterback in the league. Uh, and again, more it's more likely that the Chiefs are going to make the Super Bowl again. Uh, let's transition to um, the NFC Championship game where the Niners and the where the Rams beat the Niners. They had to come back, though. Um, were you surprised that the Niners kind of jumped out to that 17-7 lead going into the fourth quarter? You know, I, I really wasn't. I picked the Niners to win that game, and when they had that early lead, I felt really good about it because I thought, you know, this is a tough matchup for the Rams. There's certain teams, you know that, that old saying in boxing styles make fights? Well, the Rams just don't match up well with this Niners team, and they're, they're super familiar, obviously, being division rivals. The Rams, had, or excuse me, the Niners had had their number. They'd won six straight against the Rams going into that game. I felt really confident that the Niners could pull the upset in this one, and it looked like it was going to happen, but the Niners, they really got to that game led by their running game and their defense. And we know that's kind of where they hang their hat, but neither one of those units really played that great. But like you said, 10-point lead in the fourth. They watched it disappear, and it really was because of the running game. That's that's the straw that stirs the drink for the 49ers, as we know. But 2.5 yards per carry in that game was their fewest of the whole season. The Rams did an awesome job of bottling up that running game and limiting what they do. The Rams' passing strategy in that game was interesting to me because we know that Niners defense, especially the defensive line led by Bosa and Armstead and those guys, they can get after it. And the Rams knew it. They came in with a quick passing attack. They didn't 
They didn't allow more than two sacks in that game. So they really did a really good job of keeping Stafford upright and making plays down the field. But it really came down to the third down. We know how important third down is in the NFL, and that's where the Rams really won this game. 11 for 18 on third down, held the 49ers offense to three of nine on third down, and I think that was really key. Yeah, and I think another thing, too, in the game, when the Rams or when the Niners had a 17-7 lead, I thought there was a few mistakes that the Rams made. I think the Rams had a few drop catches in that game. They had a one or two turnovers. Matt Gay missed a field goal in that first half. And I think that was kind of one of the reasons why the Niners had that 17-7 lead. But we have now seen this twice in a big in a big game where Jimmy Garoppolo has a 10-point lead. He had a 10-point lead in the Super Bowl a few years ago, and he ended up basically squandering, and they end up losing. And I think that's another thing, too, with the Niners. I think we kind of saw that Garoppolo is probably not the answer, and that's there's a reason why they traded for Trey Lance. Um, and another thing with Garoppolo is, where do you think he'll be next year? Because I don't think he's going to be in San Francisco. Where do you see him in a few months? You know, it's really hard to say. With with Garoppolo, he's a guy, he's, he's a very solid starter, He's not a great player, as we know, but he's a solid starter. I think in the right system, we've seen that he can have a lot of success. Like you mentioned, getting to the Super Bowl, getting to another NFC Championship this this year. And, and he played pretty good in that game up until the fourth quarter. I actually put most of the blame on Shanahan. I actually think Shanahan put him in a really bad position. They just abandoned the running game and got him in a whole bunch of second and long, third and longs. And Debo Samuel getting the ball one time in the fourth. I I just think it was a terrible game plan late in that game. They went away from their bread and butter. But with Garoppolo, I think he's going to have to go somewhere where they've got a strong running game and they've got a good team around him. Because as we know, he's not one of those guys that can really elevate and carry a team, but he can be a really nice complimentary piece on a good team. There's some rumors about Pittsburgh possibly with Ben moving on. They're a team that has a lot of talent and a big hole at quarterback now. That might be a decent fit. It doesn't really feel like the Steelers' MO, but it wouldn't shock me. Um, As far as other teams, you know, it's hard to say. Who who do you feel like, uh, who would you think would make a good fit? Well, I think, as you mentioned, Pittsburgh, uh, that's kind of a big place there. And I think that I don't know if the Steelers have too late of a draft pick to really draft the quarterback. And I don't think Mason Rudolph or Dwayne Haskins or Josh Dobbs is really the future. Um, and another place, too, that I've been rumored is Denver. Uh, Denver is probably not going to bring back Bridgewater. They're probably going to end up releasing or trading Drew Locke. And if somehow Rodgers doesn't end up there, um, if Russell Wilson gets traded to Seattle, the Seahawks might need a quarterback. They well, actually, that that wouldn't work out. But there'd be a few other teams, maybe Minnesota, um, depending on what they do with Kirk Cousins. There's just a lot of teams, I think. But I think Pittsburgh makes the most sense, really, because if you look at all the other teams in the league, we have, I don't know what's going to happen with Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson, but it just seems like Pittsburgh is kind of that team. And again, they don't have a high, very high draft pick where they can draft a quarterback. But I mean, I mean, we'll see what happens. But uh, I mean, do you think? Let's just keep talking about Jimmy Garoppolo. Do you think he'll actually, maybe in two or three years, do you think he'll still be a starting quarterback? It's hard to say because where you play as a quarterback just plays such a huge part of a quarterback's success. We look at these guys, they get a ton of credit when they win, and we blame them when they lose. But really, there's so much more involved. It's coaching. It's the players around you. It's the run game. It's the defense. It's your wide receivers. So, you know, it really is impossible to say. It wouldn't surprise me if in the next couple of years we see him more in a backup role. But if he fits on a team like Pittsburgh, um, maybe a team that's got enough pieces around him. You know, their team has got a lot of young uh, playmakers at wide receiver. They've got a really good young uh, running back. They've got a really good young tight end. They've got some stars on the defensive side. And they've got a Hall of Fame coach. So when you put that kind of structure around a guy like Jimmy Garoppolo, who knows? You know, maybe they can kind of re, uh, resurface here as a threat in the AFC North. It's hard to say. Yeah, and the AFC North, I think, is going to be loaded. Of course, Cincinnati is going to be good again next year. Baltimore, if they get fully healthy, I think they're going to be good. I think Cleveland might take another step back next year, depending on what they do with their quarterback situation. But yeah, the NFC, AFC North is going to be competitive again. If especially if Garoppolo ends up going to Pittsburgh, um, let's start talking about the Super Bowl now. And this has been a question I think that everybody has asked on every show and stuff like that. I believe he is, but I think guys like Kurt Warner wasn't sure exactly. But do you think if the Rams win a Super Bowl, do you think Matt Stafford is a Hall of Famer? 
Boy, that's tough. Um, let's look at the resume. One Pro Bowl, mm -hmm. zero All Pro teams, which is a big one because we know that those are much more important than even Pro Bowls. Zero MVPs, which is something else that when you're looking at a Hall of Fame resume, you don't have to be an MVP, but it certainly helps. He doesn't have any of those things. So it's a little bleak as far as the individual accolades are concerned. Now he's 12th all-time in passing yards. He's 12th all-time in passing touchdowns. But the lack of team success prior to this year is a bit alarming. And, and like I said, just the, the resume, when you just look at it at, at right now, if we just paused his career and put the Super Bowl on the shelf here right now, I'd have to say no. I think he's right on the fence. And <clears throat> he's a guy who had zero playoff wins coming into this year. He He's had some nice numbers. Now, the stats are pretty good. I just, I'm not sure it's a Hall of Fame resume. Now, a Super Bowl win will certainly help his case. But even then, I don't think it's a lock. I think it's one of those situations people say, well, you know, he played for the Lions and this and that. It's like, yeah, but he had a Hall of Fame wide receiver in Calvin Johnson, and they couldn't even win a single playoff game, never even won the division. It's just he's right on the kind of fence for me. I don't think that he's necessarily a Hall of Famer. Now, like I said, a Super Bowl will go a long way. Um, and maybe put maybe it is what pushes him into the hall. I think as of right now, though, I, I'd have to say no. Well, I think, in my opinion, I think if he wins a Super Bowl, he's an MVP. But if you really look at it, this year he had a great year. I think he threw 42 touchdowns and 17 interceptions. I think he threw for close to 5,000 yards, and yet he wasn't selected to the Pro Bowl. I thought that was very interesting. I think there's been a few years where he's been kind of screwed. And I think after Calvin Johnson left, I think Detroit's first season, they went nine and seven and made the playoffs, which was kind of impressive. But I mean, if you really look at it, his stats are definitely there to be a Hall of Famer. But I think at times he's been kind of screwed from Pro Bowl selections and all pros. And I think a lot of times, too, is because he was in Detroit for all those years, all those years. So. I think a lot of times, too, this year especially, I think he was snubbed out of a Pro Bowl because I think he should have made it to the Pro Bowl, but they didn't select him. So I think if he does win the Super Bowl, he's definitely a Hall of Famer because he's and he has the numbers to pick it up. But, yeah, again, no MVPs doesn't really help his cause, no all-pro teams. But I think at times he's been kind of snubbed just because he was in Detroit. And, you know, I think he deserves more than just one Pro Bowl. But I think by the time of his end of his career, he'll have multiple Pro Bowls. We'll see, though, because there, I think there's still a lot of time. I mean, he still what, has at least five or six more years. So, I mean, we'll see what happens. But I, I think if he wins the Super Bowl, he's a Hall of Famer. But let's go on to the next quarterback. If Joe Burrow wins this Super Bowl, where will he be ranked among the active quarterbacks today? Um, you know, it's interesting because it, it's the thing about Super Bowls is, you know, and like we were talking about with with Matthew Stafford there, Super Bowls it's still a team achievement, you know. And we we put we put a lot of uh, emphasis on quarterbacks who win Super Bowls, guys who didn't win Super Bowls. We look at that a lot. Um, I think he's in the top five and, and I think, you know, I don't think that um, a Super Bowl, you know, necessarily like shoots him way up the list or anything. I think he'd probably be top five right now prior to this playoff run. And I think if he wins it, he's still probably top five. You know, if I was going to just, when I was going through the list of guys, obviously Brady's off that list. Now he would have been there for me, but Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, Josh Allen, and Burrow's probably right there. But a guy that I think is right there with him is Justin Herbert. And he hasn't had the team success, obviously, that Burrow has had. But when you look at the three guys that are kind of more established in the league, as far as Josh Allen, Aaron Rodgers, and Patrick Mahomes, those guys have obviously been in the league longer, so they have a little more of a resume behind their name where Joe, uh, Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert obviously just came into the league in these last two years. If I'm starting a franchise today, I'd still take Herbert in front of Joe Burrow. And that might sound like a hot take. People think, oh, what are you talking about? He's in the Super Bowl. Look at Joe Burrow. It's like, look, Joe Burrow's awesome. I mean, this guy's great. He's going to be great for a really long time. I think Cincinnati's going to be really competitive for a really long time. But I look at Herbert. He's the bigger, stronger athlete, the better arm. He does everything Joe Burrow does, but possibly at a higher level. Joe Burrow just has the most unbelievable rookie wide receiver we have maybe ever seen in the NFL outside of possibly Randy Moss. 
the guy just took Burrow to a whole nother level this year. Herbert just doesn't have that. He doesn't have the uh, the guys around him yet. He's got a, he's got a nice team, but he doesn't have the team that I think Burrow's had. And, and Burrow's been on a pretty hot run here for sure. But obviously, like you look at this playoff run, they're they're on the verge of getting blown out in the AFC Championship game. We talked about the momentum swing in that one. They sneak by the Titans. They had a nice win against the Raiders, but it's the Raiders. It's like th- this playoff run feels a little Cinderella for me. So I don't want to put too much emphasis on the Super Bowl run. It's awesome. And if he wins it, it's really going to be impressive. Don't get me wrong. But I'm not going to like just push him way up the list because of a Super Bowl win. Yeah, I agree. And I think he's – I don't know if he's top five yet. I think it might be too early to rank him up there. But I think he's somewhere in the top ten. I think really – I mean, by the end of time this season, I'll probably have the top ten. But I think Burrow is good and everything. And you mentioned, too, he had some games like in Tennessee. I mean, Ryan Tannehill, if he plays better in that game, they probably win. Um, then, of course, you have the momentum swing against the Chiefs. And the first game against the Raiders, yeah, it's, it's kind of the Raiders. So – I mean, there are some few things that are suspect, but I mean, it was still a great run. And yeah, Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase are awesome together, but I, I would probably have him somewhere in the top 10. Before we have uh, Super Bowl predictions, um, who do you think has the better game on Sunday, Jamar Chase or Cooper Cobb? You know, I, I was just talking about Chase and his historic rookie season. This kid is just unbelievable. But what Cooper Cup has done this year is truly unprecedented. I mean, we have not seen a season like this in over 20 years i think the statistically the last time we saw anything close to this was jerry rice in his prime like 95 i think i was looking was the last time we saw numbers in this ballpark cooper cup has become unguardable this guy has just become an unbelievable weapon for the rams and with the emergence of obj and and how he's fitting into this offense so well these last several weeks and being a legit threat in his own right on the other side i think it's going to be really hard for cincinnati to slow down cup or or to bracket him or roll safeties to his side if you start doing that obj is going to go off and i think they know that and i think not to take away from t higgins or boyd i think those guys are very good solid receivers but i think the rams with jalen ramsey possibly being able to go one-on-one with Chase. That'll be an interesting matchup to watch. But if they can go one-on-one, I think that is going to limit what Chase can do in this game. If Chase starts to go off, I could see the Rams adjusting and maybe going in double-teaming Chase and just trying to take him away and, and forcing Higgins or Boyd to beat them. And with their pass rush, it'll be hard for Joe Burrow to possibly get to that second, third read. But with that being said, I just feel like the matchup – it favors Cup in this one for sure, for in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's interesting too, and yeah, <clears throat> you don't think about it, but the Rams do have a Jalen Ramsey, and the Bengals don't have a Jalen Ramsey. Like that's going to be a huge factor as well. And again, you mentioned that too, and yeah, I think the Rams again they just have such an experienced team, and that defense is loaded with talent like Jalen Ramsey, uh, Aaron Donald, of course, Von Miller, Leonard Floyd. So yeah, I would I I would probably agree with you. I think Cooper Cup's going to have a better game, but it's really and for the Rams, it's kind of pick your poison. Do you want Cooper Cup to beat you, or do you want Odell Beckham to beat you? So and the Bengals, I mean, they have some solid receivers, but it's basically just jamar chase and i mean we'll see what happens but yeah i could definitely see cooper cup having the be- uh, better game all right again um who do you have winning the super bowl and uh why so i'm taking the rams um i think they've got the edge in a couple key spots <clears throat> excuse me and one of them is the head coaching spot not to take anything away from zach taylor but this is sean McVay's second time in this game i think that that experience factor is big and just the fact that McVeigh was the head coach who had Zach Taylor on his uh, on his team as an assistant for a few years, there's a familiarity there. So I, I give the coaching edge to McVeigh in this one, and I think he's going to be a little more familiar with Zach Taylor's tendencies, considering that he was a mentor to Zach Taylor. So there's an edge there, but the, the big edge, and a lot of people are talking about it, but it's hard to ignore is that Bengals offensive line versus the Rams defensive line. And everybody gets carried away with the fantasy stuff. And and don't get me wrong, I I love touchdowns too. But the guys who really follow the game like you and me, we know that the game is won or lost in the trenches. And that's really where football is still won or lost. And for me, this is the biggest mismatch in this game. The Bengals O-line is one of the worst pass uh, pass blocking teams, or O-lines, excuse me, in the entire NFL. I believe they were 30th in pass blocking win rate. The Rams D-line is number one 
in pass rush win rate. So you want to talk about a massive mismatch there. The Bengals are really going to have to be able to, to slow down this Rams pass rush if they're going to have any chance in this game. If that means bringing in multiple tight ends, if it means keeping Mixon and some of these uh, backs in the backfield for some max uh, max protection looks, they're going to have to get creative because if Aaron Donald and Von Miller and these guys start roughing up Burrow, I think it's going to be a long day for the Bengals. That's a matchup to watch for me. But yeah, I think overall the Rams just have the more experienced team, the more talented team. They have the coaching advantage and they're playing at home. And I think that got a little undersold last year when the Chiefs were the favorite. Everybody was talking about that. But here's Brady and these guys sleeping in their own beds, not traveling, not having to deal with hotels or any of that stuff. There is something to be said about that. So I think there's a a comfort level. And just knowing that you're home with your family, your house nearby, all that stuff, I think that actually plays a factor, especially in this huge stage. Yeah, and I mean, that's a good point, too. I keep on forgetting about that. Yeah, but for the second straight year, the team that or the, the team that's hosting the Super Bowl is playing in the Super Bowl, and that's a big one, too. And yeah, you for, you mentioned the defensive line for the Rams. Um, I mean, you saw what the Titans did to the Bengals. They had, uh, what, sacked Burrow nine times, and the Titans' D is good, but not quite as good as the Rams. And like, that could that might be a long day for Joe Burrow, especially if he can't get it to Jamar Chase. And that I think it's going to be a huge advantage for the Rams. I think the Rams are going to win this game, and I think it's going to start off close. But I think by the time of the fourth quarter, with the veter with the veterans the Rams have, and with the experience they have, and with just the much better talent, I think they're overall going to win this game. I could see them winning like thirty-eight to seventeen. I think was my prediction. But I just think the Rams just have too much talent. They, again, they have such a better team. They have more veterans. Um, you know, like I said, this is Sean McVay's second Super Bowl. He knows Zach Taylor. So I just think that overall, the Rams are just the better team, and I think it's going to show on Sunday. So. And again, thanks for coming on, Brad. Um, I always enjoy people coming on, like guests and stuff like that. Do you have anything else you want to add before we end the interview? No, I just want to say I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast. I love talking ball. I love your podcast. I think you do a great job covering all this stuff. And it's been really a lot of fun coming on here. So thank you so much for the time and having me today. We'll definitely have to do it again. All right, definitely down for that. Um, Again, don't forget to check out the Pint Glass Football Podcast. Uh, Host is Brad Fowler. Again, thanks for coming on, Brad. Enjoy the Super Bowl and enjoy the rest of the week.